All right, 107, let's uh, finish off employment law. We were at slide 141 at the end of the last uh, portion of the video, and we talked about the Bardell case, the six things, six things you look at when you're trying to determine how much notice an employee is required to receive if you're letting them go. Um, add to that six um, is the Lazarowitz case, the Wallace case, and the Beyer case, okay? Um, now we're going to look at what the employee sues you for in the event that um, they believe they have been wrongfully dismissed. They sue for damages and reinstatement. Damages, um, <clears throat> I am a lawyer with uh, a downtown law firm. I've been there for nine years. Uh, they let me go. They give me two months notice. Um, I believe that I should be entitled to nine months, which is probably pretty, pretty close to what I should get. So I've suffered seven months damages. That's great. So um, I sue for that. And um, in certain circumstances, I'm, if I have a hard time finding an other employment, I might want to sue for reinstatement saying you have to take me back. Well, uh, that doesn't happen very much in master-servant relationships because um, there would be a animosity there, a toxic relationship, and they, they would take you back and then they would turn around and give you nine months notice that your job's coming to an end and you'd be gone anyway. Um, in union management, it happens quite often, though, particularly pursuant to terms in a collective agreement, but we'll get into that towards the end of the chapter. Um, there's a flip side to the coin here, though. If you dismiss me and I was entitled to nine months and I only got two, then I sue you for damages. But what happens if I, as the employee, want to leave? Um, how much notice do I have to give you? And the knee-jerk reaction is, well, two weeks. Okay, you hear that out in the marketplace all the time. Oh, you give them two weeks notice and leave. Uh, not so you are required to give the same amount of notice to the employer as the employer is required to give to you. So I've been with the law firm downtown for nine years. Um, I want to jump to another law firm. I have to give my current employer nine months notice that I plan to leave. Um, this is, and, and if I don't do that, it's called wrongful leaving. And just like the employer or the employee can sue the employer for wrongful dismissal, the employer can sue the employee for wrongful leaving. Well, that doesn't happen very much. Let me explain why. If I am a janitor or if I am a line worker in a plant and um, I give two weeks notice that I'm quitting um, and I should have given my employer eight weeks because I've been there 11 years under the Employment Standards Act, you know, um, then uh, then I've, I've wrongfully left, but the employer is not going to sue me because he is or she is going to be able to replace me relatively quickly. So what damages have has the business suffered? None, all right, or very little, which makes it uneconomical to commence a lawsuit. Um, but when you get into managerial situations, um, and let's say somebody in a marketing firm is uh, really fantastic, and another marketing firm wants to draw him away, um, and they make him an offer, and so he gives uh, two months notice uh, and, and leaves, okay? Well, he should have given nine months notice. So there's the employer has been damaged to the tune of seven months, if that employee is critical to that operation, that employer is going to sue for wrongful leaving. Um, and we saw in the chapter on torts that uh, maybe the employer can also sue the other business if the other business enticed him away and induced your former employee to break his contract with you. Okay, so that's wrongful dismissal, wrongful leaving. Another factor that comes into play with that is mitigation. Um, I'm a lawyer with a downtown firm. They dismiss me. They give me two months. They should have given me nine. So I'm going to get seven months damages. Well, I have to try to mitigate my loss. I have to say, okay, what can I do to reduce the amount of damages that I'm claiming for? I have to go out and I have to actively look for a job. Okay. 
Um, so I go and I look for uh, uh, an associate lawyer's position with another law firm. Um, I hunt high, I hunt low, I look in other provinces. I just cannot find a job because of the downturn in the economy, uh, you know, caused by COVID-19 or just, uh, you know, a meltdown of the stock exchange like we saw a number of years ago. So I cannot get a job. Well, then I'm going to be entitled for my full seven. But if I don't look for a job and I just go to Mexico and lie on the beach and drink uh, cervezas and, and read books and have a nice time, come back with a tan, I go into court. I have not taken any steps to mitigate my loss. I will get nothing. All right. Change the scenario a little bit. I do actively look for a job. So I'm owed seven months. Um, and after three months hunting, I finally get a job. Okay, now that means I've only suffered three months damages. Makes sense? All right, moving on. Um, the uh, topic on slide 143 is uh, the probationary employee situation. Um, I've added this because in recent case law, uh, it came to light that there was a uh, difference of opinion between lawyers and judges. Uh, <clears throat> um, the Employment Standards Act says that uh, three months is uh, the period of time in which an employer can let an employee go without paying any um, uh, money for uh, in lieu of notice or without giving any notice. And it was always assumed <clears throat> by the lawyers that you could let that employee go and you should not tell them the reason because if you gave a reason then that was just going to muddy the waters and give the employee a possible reason to commence a, 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 an action against you under the employment standards branch. Um, well um, there was a woman who became a secretary in a in a firm and um, she could do the job as a secretary but she was toxic. She was rude and abusive to the other staff. She wouldn't work with anyone else, um, it w and she was becoming a real problem. So in that three-month probationary period, the employer let her go. We just no longer require your services. Why? Well, we just no longer require your services. Why? Well, we just no longer require your services. So she thinks she's been wronged, which fits with her toxic attitude, and she goes to the Employment Standards Branch. And the judge in that case said three things which are outlined on the slide. First, the employee must justify the dismissal. So you don't have to tell her why you're letting her go. But if she complains, then you must have a real reason for doing so. There must be evidence of that unsuitability. So it's not just enough to say, well, yeah, she didn't fit you have to actually have kept some records with regard to the same. And then the manner in which you let her go has to be done fairly. So the bottom line is that with probationary employees, um, because um, uh, you're, you may wind up in the employment standards branch, you obviously want to tell the person why they don't fit into the firm, um, being very careful um, in your wording, and it's not a bad idea to consult legal counsel. So that's probationary employees. Um, remember, of course, that the, the Employment Standards Act says three months, but you can actually vary that by, stat, uh, by contract. Um, you can say, okay, three months probation is not enough time for me to actually train that employee and then see if that employee um, not only can do the job, but fits into the environment. I think I need six months. Well, you can actually have a contract with that person and and, and uh, extend that probationary period for uh, six months. You have to be careful if you think, oh, I'll just you know, do it for three years, a probationary period for three years. No, obviously, that would fall into that third category of that judge saying that it's not done fairly. Switch gears. We've talked about letting an employee go when you no longer require their services but they had been doing either an adequate or a good job. Okay, just a downturn in the economy. You've got 10 employees. You only can afford seven. You want to let three go. Okay, that's one scenario. Give them notice or you give them pay in lieu of notice. What happens, though, when you want to get rid of somebody because they have breached the contract of employment? In other words, they have done something wrong. 
they have stolen money, they, are, um, they have disobeyed orders, they are totally incompetent, okay? So um, this is dismissal for cause. You have a cause, a reason for doing so. And those are the three categories, misconduct, disobedience, and incompetence. Um, <clears throat> misconduct is, um, uh, crim I'm just going to read it off the screen because it's better. Uh, criminal activity, gross immoral conduct that uh, brings the employer's reputation into ill repute or a breach of the employer's uh, code of conduct. All right, um, a good example, a number of years ago, there was a driver mechanic with budget rent-a-truck. Um, his job was to not only maintain the vehicles, but to move them around to the various budget locations for rental purposes. After his third drunk driving conviction, they let him go. They didn't say, okay, you've been with us for six years, you get, you know, um, uh, six weeks pay in lieu of notice. No, they just, they just fired him because his action brought the company's reputation into ill repute. You cannot have a driver mechanic with three drunk driving convictions and no license, right? So um, that's an obvious one back then. We'll see, however, um, that there may be now a twist to the law as it's developed, which makes that decision um, a little more dangerous. But um, a criminal activity, they steal from you, <clears throat> um, or a grossly immoral conduct, they're looking at porn on their uh, uh, computers during uh, office hours, that sort of thing. All right, disobedience. Disobedience of a reasonable and lawful order. I mean, obviously, just for a, a, a quick example, um, you could not instruct your employee, look, sales are down. Um, why don't you pop across the street and uh, rob the 7-Eleven because we need some cash. I mean, obviously, that would be a, an unlawful order. But you can have unlawful orders in a, a more realistic scenario. Um, at one point, I was working as an associate with a law firm and I had done a lot of work with one of the partners on the file. And um, uh, the, you know, and, and I live by my billings. If I don't bill, they're, they're gonna let me go. So when the uh, lawyer came into my office and he dumps the file on my desk, he said, to bill the file. And I hated it on one hand because if I bill, I cannot charge the client for billing him, so I'm wasting a lot of time. Um, but, uh, on the other hand, I wanted to bill it because I had, um, uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars worth of billings there. So anyway, um, uh, and of course he gave it to me because it's grunt work and I was associate and he's a partner. Um, I, I did up the file and as I was going through, there were a lot of disbursements, receipts for things, expenses, which we charge for in addition to our legal fees. And they looked like they were personal, like they were some of the partner's personal receipts. So I did up the file and I came in, I gave it to him. They said, here's the bill. And there's this, um, these disbursements here that I don't think belong in the file because they look like they're personal. And he says, no, bill them. And I went, oh, okay. And I went, no, 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 I can't because they're personal. And he said, bill them. And I said, well, that's wrong. And he said, bill them or I'll fire you. So I go back to the office and I go, okay, what am I going to do? Um, if there's a problem down the road and these shouldn't have been charged, he'll say, hey, I didn't know they got in there. And, you know, my, my associate lawyer should have picked up on that. And then I'm in trouble, right? So I thought, okay, I'll bill my time in the file and my disbursements. I'll bill his time in the file and his disbursements. So I brought him in two bills and he said, one bill, I have a relationship with my client. Um, and an understanding that I can charge those one bill or I will fire you. Well, <clears throat> that is an unlawful order. And um, I had a luxury that other people in that situation might not have, and they might feel they have to do something inappropriate. Um, I walked next door, I walked into the senior partner's office and I said, that's it. If I get fired, I'm going to law society, I'm going to do a complaint, and I'll sue you for wrongful dismissal. And the partner said, well, um, are you having a bad day? And I said, uh, um, told him what happened, and he straightened it out. 
uh, <clears throat> so, but, but it put me in a, a kind of an awkward position because had I not had a wife who was um, employed, um, had we not been in a financially stable position, I might have felt pressure to, uh, uh, to do something inappropriate in order to maintain my job. Um, you're going to see a lot of those kinds of suits, I think, in various states down in the United States where um, uh, workers at a uh, meatpacking plant where COVID is running rampant are being ordered back to work, even though there's a danger that they could get sick or die. That would be, um, uh, and if they don't go back, then it would be a disobedience of an unreasonable order and uh, they could actually take their employers to uh, court. The third category is incompetence, which is defined as being no difference between um, an inability to do the job and a refusal to do the job. So I should back up and look at how you might refuse to do a job as uh, an employee uh, and being disobedient. Um, let's say you're a janitor and I have a job description that says you're supposed to clean my facilities and um, you do a pretty good job, but I come in and I say, okay, Ralph, you're, uh, you're not washing the windows. And uh, Ralph says, I don't do windows. I say, Ralph, you're my janitorial person and you're supposed to clean and, you know, you're supposed to, I don't do windows. Well, then you can fire that employee for disobedience. The difficulty with that, of course, is that um, under the Employment Standards Branch, they always say if you don't, take the necessary steps of telling them what they're doing wrong, telling them how to do it right, and trying to accommodate them, then it may be construed as wrongful dismissal because you are a lousy manager, all right? Not that your actions were inappropriate, but you're, you're, you broke the contract because you're a bad manager. Um, so <clears throat> I, I don't do windows. And you come to come to him and you say, Ralph, the windows are, are dirty. And Ralph says, well, uh, I clean them every day. And I say, Ralph, they're filthy on the outside. Uh, you can open the window. There's a ledge out there. You can shimmy out onto the ledge and you can reach the windows. And you say, but we're three floors up. You know, and I mean, obviously, that would be an unreasonable order. Okay, like the COVID situation. Okay, so you're incompetent. Um, and that's pretty much the same as uh, being disobedient. Um it might be shocking to realize that there are some jobs that people just cannot do. All right. Now, I'm not talking about uh, computer programming, because if I got a job as a computer programmer, I obviously could not do it. But I'm talking about some a person who has applied for a job, looked at the job description and thought, yeah, I can do that. And then they find out they can't. Um, in my three man partnership, um, I <clears throat> eventually wound up doing a little bit of the HR management work because uh, the, our office manager was totally incompetent. Um, we had uh, three lawyers um, and two secretarial staff. One was a legal assistant, which helped the intellectual property lawyer, and the other was basically just a secretary. I shouldn't say just a secretary. Not a legal secretary, okay? Had secretarial skills. We did work for five or six major um, advertising agencies, and it was, it was a, a different type of relationship, usually, um, for lawyers because um, Bob Mackay had um, contacts because he was in marketing and advertising with all these firms. And we all dealt with the vice presidents and the presidents and the senior account managers. Um, and <clears throat> um, the, the reason that we got most of the work um, west of Toronto was because we changed the way we did the work. Okay, um, If an ad agency comes up with a marketing plan and they give it to a, a regular lawyer and they say, uh, give us a legal opinion on that, three weeks will go by uh, and they'll get a five or six page legal opinion on that particular ad. Um, that doesn't work in the marketplace because Ad agencies are working on a fast timeline. These ads got to be approved, got to get out, got to you know, got to get them, uh, you know, uh, videotaped or uh, you know, typed into the newspaper, that sort of thing. They need a twenty-four hour turnaround. So Bob McKay very cleverly said, "Okay, you send me the ads in written form, 
We'll go through and we'll make handwritten notes on, you know, any problems with them. We'll initial the bottom, we'll give you a call right away, and then we'll courier um, the, um, uh, the version with our initials on it back to you. Now, think about it. Um, when we talked about the nine bullets in at the end of chapter uh, one, the things you can do to use your lawyer's time effectively, one of them was not to give instructions by telephone. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, I amended that and I said, do not give instructions by telephone unless you follow up. So we would tell them about the ad. Then we would courier back, uh, either same day or overnight, the uh, written confirmation of that so that we were confirming what we told them. All right. Um, just to let you know I'm serious about those nine bullets. Uh, so anyway... Um, we had these ads from these various agencies and at the end of the day we would courier back the McKim advertising ads to McKim and the Jarvis ads to Jarvis and the Baker Lovick to Baker Lovick but the secretary kept getting them screwed up and we get a call from uh, McKim advertising and they say look we've got some Hayhurst ads here that were sent to us by mistake now because of our relationship with these firms um, the, it didn't cause any problems for us, but it could have because that's a breach of confidentiality. And from a law firm, that's really serious. And so keeping with what you're supposed to do with employees, we came out and we told the uh, secretary what she had done wrong and how she should do it right. We still got them screwed up. So we then went to her and said, okay, we're going to put baskets on your desk, one for McKim, one for Baker Lovick, one for Jarvis, one for Hayhurst, and you know, so on. And we'll put the ads in there, and so you just take the McKim ones out and you put them in an envelope, courier them over. She still gets them screwed up. So then we had, you know, the baskets there, you know, with the bottom and a top tray. Envelopes already addressed in the bottom to McKim, put the McKim ads in the top. All she has to do is take the McKim ads, put them in the McKim envelope, call a courier. Still gets it screwed up. Um, Finally, I'm in the office one day and I'm talking to Bob McKay. And the first thing you have to remember is that um, he was a teddy bear. He, was, uh, he did marketing and advertising. He wasn't a confrontational lawyer, didn't like going to court, that sort of thing. Um, so he's a pretty nice guy. Um, and it took a lot to get him rattled. But we, we were, I was in his office when he got a call from one of the ad agencies that said, look, we got some more ads sent to us by mistake. Bob takes the phone, he slams it down, he goes, God, bring a damn blow. Opens the door, he walks out, and he says, look, I'm sorry, but you're fired. And you know what she said? Thank God. She said, I just, I don't know why, but I just cannot do that. It's, I just, I get numbed by the mundane process, and I just can't do it. And she got up and left. Okay. So... Um, there was somebody who um, just could not do the job. Um, all right, so those are the three categories. There is a possible fourth category here, and it falls into the gray area um, that's so uh, exciting for lawyers because it puts a, uh, <clears throat> it gives us a lot of work. And that is if somebody has an illness that interferes with the ability to do the job on an ongoing basis, then you can fire them. But you have to be really careful that it is an actual illness um, because when I go back to that uh, category of the um, uh, the dr budget rent-a-car driver or truck driver, um, three drunk driving convictions, probably an alcoholic, all right? And the courts are grappling with the distinction between an illness and a disability. And the courts seem to be leaning toward, and they do this with medical evidence that's provided to them by doctors. They just don't do it themselves. They're leaning towards the belief that alcoholism is a disability rather than an illness, which came up with um, a manager at a liquor, uh, liquor uh, BC liquor store. Um, well, perfect job for an alcoholic, right? Um, and at the end of the day, he'd send the staff home and then he would take a, a few bottles of whatever he needed. Eventually, the discrepancy in sales and and um, inventory um, indicated that he was, he was the one that was doing it. And so he was fired. 
um, and the courts took the position that uh, this was probably a disability and that they should not fire him. They should actually try to accommodate him. How do you do that? Well, you move him to a managerial position where he has no access to inventory. Simple as that, okay? Um, there is a, another scenario where there was an architectural firm and a number of architects worked there. One of them is in a car accident on the weekend. He winds up in a wheelchair. He comes back and he says, okay, I'm ready to go back to work. And the, um, uh, the firm said, uh, well, uh, we can't because our premises are not uh, wheelchair accessible. You know, this isn't our building. We're only renting here. And uh, uh, the employee did not um, sue for wrongful dismissal. He took them to the Human Rights Tribunal. And the Human Rights Tribunal said you should pay the money to make your premises wheelchair accessible, which was going to cost the firm about $22,000 quite a number of years ago. So it was a pretty big hit because it was a small firm, and that comes that's out of the profit that goes to the uh, pocket of the um, owner, right? Um, but they said you should, you should do that, okay? Because um, it's a disability, it's not an illness, and it doesn't interfere with his ability to do the job on an ongoing basis. Almost the exact same scenario, <clears throat> a server in the restaurant, young man, fantastic server, gets paid a wage, but makes a lot of money on tips. And um, he's in an accident, he's in a wheelchair, he comes back to the restaurant owner and he says, okay, I'm ready to go back to work. And the owner says, well, I, you, you cannot maneuver around the tables, so what I will do is I will build a platform behind the bar, you can become the bartender and I will pay you the same wage. The young man is really upset because he makes most of his income from the, um, uh, <clears throat> the tips because he was so good. <clears throat> so anyway, he takes the owner to the um, uh, Human Rights Tribunal, and the Human Rights Tribunal said, um, why didn't you accommodate him? And the owner of the restaurant said, because I have 13 tables in my restaurant, and if I take out four, which would be the minimum amount I could take out and still allow him access to the tables, I will not make a profit. If I don't make a profit, I go to business and everybody's unemployed. And I tried to accommodate him. And the young man made a big deal about how much he was making in tips. Uh, and then it came to the court's attention that he had not been filing income tax, uh, tax and declaring the full amount of the tips. So his action was dismissed on the basis of a long-standing um, concept at common law that you cannot come to court with dirty hands. Now that doesn't mean you know washing your hands and you know they're uh, they're clean. No, what it means is you cannot uh, be doing something inappropriate, either committing a crime or doing something unethical, and then ask for the court's help. Okay, so that's the concept of um, uh, dismissal for cause. All right. I'm a lawyer with a firm. I've been there for nine years, and they um, they decide to uh, fire me because they think I'm doing some unethical activities. How much notice do they have to give me? Well, I've been there for nine years. It's sort of like managerial, so nine months, eh, wrong, okay? You dismissing somebody for cause, so this would be misconduct, uh, could be misconduct and disobedience if they uh, if they have a misconduct because I shouldn't should not do unethical activities and disobedience because they probably have some sort of a code of conduct that I would be in breach of. So no pay in lieu of notice, no notice required. Risk management practice. Um, it's very expensive to get rid of an employee, whether it's dismissal for cause, or whether you're just downsizing. It is also fraught with dangers that there will be a legal action. So it would be a really good idea if as a manager of the firm, you had a process that would encourage the employee to improve and you can actually save them. Because if you save them, number one is they're gonna like you as an employee or employer even more so, and number two, you don't have these other two problems of cost and legal actions. 
Um, <clears throat> on slide 146, we have um, five things that you can do. Good potential Part B exam question, five things you can do. Uh, you're going to have an employee file. Um, there should be periodic employee reviews, whether they are a good employee or whether they are a bad employee. Okay, so you bring in a good employee, you say you're doing a really good job, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in line for a promotion, uh, keep up the good work, thank you very much. All right, uh, bad employee, you get them in and you give them a clear warning about their non-performance. Then you do whatever you can to assist them um, to improve. Um, and then you, on that file, have a sign-off procedure. Um, I'd like you to just initial here uh, this memo of our conversation. Uh, you're not agreeing with what I said. You're just acknowledging that we had this conversation. The employee says, I am not signing nothing. You can't make me sign nothing. Um, and <clears throat> eventually you, you have, uh, you know, three or four of these uh, meetings and then you go okay I'm you know next time you're you're fired happens again you fire them they go to the employment standards branch you go in and I'm actually telling a story of of the um, baker uh, uh, husband and wife baker restaurant scenario they had uh, an employee like that and uh, <clears throat> he went to the employment standards branch and they asked me and uh, my clients asked me to come in and and uh, represent them. And we walked in and I, I sort of purposely took the file because it was fairly thick and dropped it. I could have placed it on the table, but I dropped it uh, just to signal that there was this big thick file. And then we went through the hearing and I was talking about on this occasion, they didn't, I didn't sign nothing. I, you know, and then we had this, and yeah, but I didn't sign that neither. And eventually the, uh, the hearing officer you know, looked at Pamela and said, what took you so long to fire this person? Okay, so if you got this file, two things, it'll either improve the employee and then you won't have to get rid of them, or number two, if you have to get rid of them, then um, you'll have some backup when you go to the Employment Standards Branch. Um, <clears throat> just to summarize, um, you give notice um, or pay in lieu of notice to employees when you're letting them go. Um, for uh, because you, you're downsizing um, or if you're um, firing them then no notice or pay in lieu of notice. One topic before we conclude master servant and that's the concept of constructive dismissal. You can actually wind up being sued because you as the employer have breached the contract and you did not get rid of the employee. <laughs> you know, um, I have uh, you know, eight uh, salespeople let's say and I want to get it up to 15 salespeople, but I have a hard time managing 15 people. So I go to the best salesperson and I say, okay, uh, Sarah, you're, you're my top performer. What I would like to do is I would like to appoint you as the manager of the sales personnel and uh, you'll get a higher salary. Okay, no need to travel. Well, that sounds good. Sarah does it. Four months later, COVID-19, we have to cut back. So I no longer need a manager of the sales team because I'm going to cut the sales team back by five people anyway. So I go to Sarah and I say, Sarah, um, I don't need you as a manager anymore, but I don't want to lose you. So, you know, you know starting Monday, you just, uh, you know, go back to your original job. Well, I have not dismissed her, um, <clears throat> but I have unilaterally changed the terms of our employment agreement. <clears throat> so um, before I could do that, I would have to go to Sarah and I would have to say, Sarah, um, I no longer require you as a manager. So what I'm proposing is that you've been with me for five years. Um, you are entitled to five months employment. So I am either going to pay you a lump sum payment or for the next five months you work as a, a manager after which time, um, if you want to continue to work for me, you'll go back as a salesperson. Or if you choose not to, then you can leave. Okay, because then you've given her the appropriate notice or pay in lieu of notice um, to re rever revert her to her previous employment. Um, she could actually continue to work for you as a salesperson while 
simultaneously suing you for constructive dismissal. And you couldn't fire her as a salesperson because she's suing you um, <clears throat> because she had a legal right to do so. Constructive dismissal can happen in another scenario. There was a, a woman who took over the management of a um, uh, arts theater complex and it was in complete disarray. It had, uh, I think, uh, something like um, $12,000 debt. So it was in the red, had only a couple of part-time employees. She takes it over, she's a dynamo. Within a couple of years, she has um, <clears throat> managed to um, refurbish the building, refurbish the theater. Um, they've got art shows on. They've, they're doing four plays in the theater themselves. They're, they're hiring out to other companies uh, theatrical companies and doing four more plays. They have a, you know quite a number of staff. The building's painted. The grounds are done. <clears throat> so she's done a really phenomenal job. Um, <clears throat> not only that, but she was managing the facility, but she was also managing the theater. So she was the production manager for the plays. She was actually directing some of the plays. Um, she was doing a really good job. However, when she first started, it was manageable because there wasn't much there. After a couple of years, this is a big operation and she's close to burnout. The board of directors for the uh, theater complex get together and they go, okay, we do not want to lose this woman. So why don't we split the job, manage the facility, manage the theater, okay? And we will make her managing the facility and gave, give her the same wage that she was getting. And then we'll hire somebody to manage the theater. So they go and they hire somebody to manage the theater. Then they bring in this woman and they say, okay, guess what? This is this is it. And she goes, but I, I don't want to manage the facility. I want to manage the theater. Oh, but we've already hired somebody. Constructive dismissal, right? She's doing it. So you cannot unilaterally change the terms of employer of her employment. So they should have gone to her and said, we're splitting the job, you can have your choice. Manage the facility, manage the theater. But they didn't do that. Okay, so that's constructive dismissal. In that situation, the uh, the person left and commenced the legal action. Um, slide uh, 48 and 49 is a long list of things that you should do as an HR manager um, in order to uh, make sure that you have things under control. Starts off with assess your employment needs. You gotta have a job description, job specifications. You establish um, a, uh, a hiring or prepare a hiring advertisement. You run it by your lawyer to make sure that you don't uh, contravene the human rights code. You prepare an application form, and I want to talk about that a little bit um, because there are questions that you cannot ask during an interview, and we've already gone over that. Um, uh, but there are questions that you should not ask on your application form as well. Um, you should not ask um, sex, male or female, unless it's a bona fide uh, job qualification. Um, you should not ask age, unless it's a bona fide job qualification, and I don't know how that could be. Um, and you don't want to ask if they've had a criminal record, okay? Um, and I'm not sure whether I dealt with that enough when we talked about the questions you can or cannot answer or ask at a job interview. So I'm going to review it here if I did talk about it earlier or I'll cover it now. Um, you cannot ask if somebody has a criminal record. Why? I would, I, I think it's kind of important, you know, I, as an employer for me to know if the person I'm hiring has had three drunk, or not drunk driving, three armed robbery convictions. Okay. I think it goes to their character to a certain degree. And yet there are a lot of people out there that run afoul of the law and straighten themselves out. And if we say, oh, I'm not hiring him because he's got a criminal record, or I'm not hiring her because she's got a couple of um, uh, uh, you know, uh, crimes on her record, then they'll have no option but to go out and continue committing crimes. So obviously there's a public policy reason for why you cannot ask about a criminal record. Um, so um, what, what can you do? Well, if they handle cash or valuable securities at your place of business, you can ask if they have a criminal record, all right? 
what that means is <clears throat> if you get a bond uh, on your employees um, to cover the potential of the disappearance of money or valuable securities, um, then you can ask if they are bondable, not if they have a criminal record. Okay, you can say, are you bondable? What's that mean? Well, that means I'm going to go out and I'm trying to get insurance on you um, <clears throat> and on all my employees because that way if there's theft, um, which is called defalcation, theft by employees, then um, uh, my insurance will cover it. All right, well, let's ask everybody if they're bondable. Um, and then that way we'll find out if they have a criminal record because if you have a criminal record, the insurance company will not give a bond which is called fidelity insurance, right? <clears throat> Cannot do that. If you get bonds on your employees, then you can ask an applicant if they have a criminal record. But if you think, well, I'll just ask them, you know, and then I won't get a bond. Um, you're contravening the law, and uh, if there's a problem, you can wind up in front of the uh, Human Rights Tribunal. Um, okay, so, and this can, you know, this can be a little confusing because I remember my eldest daughter was going out to get a job and she got an employment application for, a, uh, I think it was the IGA grocery store. And on there it said, are you bondable? And she went, oh, no. <laughs> and I said, whoa, why'd you do that? And she said, well, I, you know, I'm, I don't know what it means. I went, okay, you don't know what it means. Don't put a tick there because what it means is you're admitting you have a criminal record. And she went, oh, my God, really? Um, so, um, <clears throat> you, uh, you have to be, you know, very cognizant of, of doing that. Uh, you only ask if they're bondable if you get bonds of insurance on your employees. All right. So, um, that is the, um, application. Oh, no, the other thing on the application form you cannot ask, and I'm sure there's others, but I don't know about them, is social insurance number. As an employer, you need that social insurance number so that you can do the deductions for the employee, uh, for EI and workers' compensation and things like that. But you cannot ask it before you hire them. I mean, you know, why? Um, you're just collecting information about um, uh, employees. That means, uh, you know, you're going to be at risk under the Personal Information Protection Act. So um, you ask for that, you hire them, ask for it, but you don't ask for it ahead of time. Uh, all right, what else, what next on the list? <clears throat> okay, so you're going in the interview, standard interview questions. Avoid those prohibited by the employment, uh, by the Human Rights Code. And, but you make sure you ask the same questions of the applicants. Because if you have three people and there's a potential that some of them might think that because of one of the prohibited um, items under the Human Rights Code, um, they have not gotten the job because they've been discriminated against, well, you want to establish why you hired the person you did. And if you do not ask the same questions, then how can you assess the most appropriate candidate? Um, then uh, you keep a file on each of the uh, applicants interviewed. And how long do you keep it? Well, I would keep it for quite a number of years because they may sue you for um, under the Human Rights Code uh, you know, after after the deadline, there is a, a deadline in the uh, Human Rights Act or Human Rights Code. Find out what that is. Keep the file until after that date. If they have references, check the references. Um, if they um, uh, work with elderly people or young children, then you can uh, do a criminal record check to make sure that they are not a pedophile. Then you have an employment contract in writing and you attach the job description. They cannot do the job. That will allow you to get rid of them. Orientation and training, you want to do that. Um, it's, you know, it gets them up to speed um, and it also makes them feel a little bit more a part of the operation. I had a friend who worked for, uh, uh, he was a journeyman electrician. He worked for a company uh, downtown. And he was there for almost two years when they said, okay, starting Monday, you go to our other plant. And he said, what other plant? It turned out they had two operations. And it was it was almost like on a need-to-know basis, you know, uh, because they, uh, you work there for, imagine working there for two years and not knowing your employer has two two plants. It'd make you feel really important, wouldn't it? 
Um, okay, <clears throat> employment contract, I uh, interested in training. Uh, review the employee's uh, performance uh, during the probationary period. If they're not fitting in, you can get rid of them. After that, uh, you have to give them notice. Uh, periodic employee reviews of the sign-off procedure. We've talked about that. Clear warnings, and you have a duty to accommodate. Now we're going to really switch gears. Um, we are going to switch from master-servant, which is employer-employee situation where the employer has an individual contract with each employee, okay, to a situation where we have a union representing a body of those employees. So there's the employer, and he's going to have managerial contracts with certain people, and then one contract with a union that handles all those employees. Collective bargaining is the process of establishing terms of employment between an employer and a union representing that group of employees. Uh, terminology that you should know, <clears throat> certification. How does a union get to be the union for some employees? Um, once the union thinks that they have sufficient support from the employees, a number of them signed up, then they can go to the Labor Relations Board and ask to be certified as the union. So you got the Steelworkers of America, um, and they have um, this business, ABC Steel, um, that's local 421, and then they have uh, XWZ Manufacturing over here, and that would be local 912. Okay, that's what that's where you see local, you know, local something. It's because one union is representing employees at various businesses, and so they have to distinguish, you know, which ones are which. Labor Relations Board is a uh, administrative tribunal. Um, <clears throat> under our Labor Relations Code, which is a provincial statute. There's a Labor Relations Code federally for the uh, Fed employees. And uh, the Labor Relations Board does certifications and it also does grievances. Bargaining agent, that's the union, okay, for covering a group of employees. Bargaining unit, obviously units got to be the employees belong to that union. A grievance is a dispute under a collective agreement. What's a collective agreement? <clears throat> well, I have a contract with you as my employee, okay? But if I have a contract with a group of employees, then it's the collective, okay, the collective agreement covering those employees. Arbitration is a dispute which goes to the Labor Relations Board, and it would be uh, a grievance is when the union says, hey, there's a problem here. And then the um, uh, uh, if the management and the union cannot work it out, then there's the uh, arbitration that takes place. Okay, if you have edition one or two edition, if you have the first printing or second printing of the um, uh, uh, textbook, then um, what you want to do is you want to look at the supplementary um, matters, uh, papers that I've handed out. Okay, if you've got the third printing, then you're okay. Um, and you've probably got a third printing because I do not think that the uh, bookstore will be selling any used textbooks because of the COVID-19 problem. But if you buy one privately, then check to see if it, uh, if it doesn't say anything on the inside cover, it's the first printing. If it says on the inside cover, second printing, then you've got to look at the additional sheets, which I have posted to Moodle, okay? Because I have changed it. What I did, and I think I've told you this, um, I, I didn't do a second edition because then everybody that's bought a first edition could not resell them to get some money back, all right? So I've got the uh, uh, these additional pages which bring the first printing and the second printing up to date, and then the third printing is, uh, is fine. So in the third printing, I have changed the way I look at this. Um, I followed other textbooks which said there were four types of um, disputes in union management relationships. And um, when I really looked at it, I thought, no, that's, I don't think that's appropriate. I think there's only three, all right? Uh, there are certification disputes, there are collective bargaining disputes, and there are contractual disputes. Um, <clears throat> so we, what's important to remember here is um, that we are going to have um, uh, a look at what, what the disputes are 
and how they're resolved. All right, um, and just a short break for a sec. Continuing on, um, we have um, three types of potential disputes. We have certification disputes, collective bargaining disputes, and um, contractual disputes. The first is resolved by the certification procedure. What's that mean? Union comes in and they want to unionize. If you say, sure, fine, go ahead, no dispute. Okay, they just go to the Labor Relations Board and they get uh, appointed as a union. But if you as the employer think that you um, it would be better operationally if you were not unionized, then you might want to um, uh, take steps to try to um, prevent the unionization. You have to be very careful. We're not getting into that. There is a really good course uh, you can take in second year called Industrial Relations, which gets into that uh, more so. But if, um, if the union thinks they have enough people signed up, then they go to the Labor Relations Board and they say why they should be the union. You can, as the employer, go to the relations, uh, uh, Labor Relations Board and say why the union would be bad. Let's say, however, though, that the union is appointed. Now you had individual contracts, they're all gone. You have to now make sure that you collective bargain to determine what should go into the contract between you and all the employees through the union. Uh, the collective bargaining procedure is um, <clears throat> outlined in the Labor Relations Code. And uh, the, the first thing you have to do is you have to uh, bargain um, in good faith. This is on slide 154. What's that mean? Well, you've been paying $12 an hour. No, that's, that's almost minimum wage now, isn't it? Let's say $16 an hour, and the union comes in and they want you to pay $22 an hour. Um, you say, okay, if you're going to unionize, then I'm only going to pay $14 an hour. Well, you'd be um, negotiating in bad faith because you're already paying them $14. Offering $12 would be bad faith. You can be fined under the statute. Okay. Um, the, the union demanding 22 when the average in the industry is somewhere between 17 and 18, they would be arguing in bad faith. Okay, so you come in and you go, no, 14 is all your, or pardon me, 16 is all you're getting, and they say, no, uh, you know, we want 18. Well, that's sounds appropriate. So now you've got this negotiation going on. So you argue back and forth about wages and. <clears throat> you know, health matters and work safety and, and uh, all sorts of things, right? Um, uh, you cannot come to an agreement. Either party can contact the Labor Relations Board in Victoria and say, we need a conciliation officer, okay? Um, that's the generic term. In BC, it's called a mediation officer. This person comes over from Victoria, sits down with the parties, cannot dictate an answer, okay, but tries to bring them closer together. Um, <clears throat> and say, okay, you know, you're, you're paying 16, yeah, the average in the industry is 18, uh, Mr. Employer, why don't you say, <clears throat> we'll pay uh, 17 next year, 17 next year, and then by the third year, 18. Union, come on, you're, you're demanding 18, but that's, that's too hard of a hit for this business. You know, why don't you, you know, accept a uh, 17, 17, and 18, and tries to get them to agree, okay? If he agrees, the collective agreement is signed, everybody's happy. If he cannot get them to agree, he cannot force them, he goes back to Victoria. Then they go, the parties go back to negotiation, and eventually things get so heated that the union says, well, that's it, we're going on strike. Management says, okay, yeah, well, we're going to lock you out. <clears throat> What's the difference? Strike is when the employees leave and they can <clears throat> picket outside the property. They cannot interfere with the operation. Um, and the, you know, management unfair, one for all and all for one. You know, we want pay equity, you know, whatever. And um, uh, uh, they, so as I said, they cannot interfere with the operation. The operation, on the other hand, cannot hire scab labor, which are temporary employees to come in and work while the union's on strike. Um, 
Obviously, there's a lot of pressure on both sides because the union cannot stay out forever. Uh, they're not getting paid, okay? Uh, they'll have a strike fund, but that just covers some groceries and things for the employees. So they cannot stay out forever. Management doesn't necessarily win, though, because the management can't stay out forever. They have contractual obligations that they have to meet. They have product they have to sell. So um, pressure on both sides. <clears throat> so when the decision is made to either go on a, a strike or a lockout, obviously there's a lot of anger between the parties. And so the statute, the Labor Relations Code, has a cooling off period in there. And the old statute used to actually call it a cooling off period. I believe they've taken that out now. Um, it used to be you know, a fairly long period of time. Now it's just 72 hours. So the union says, that's it, we're going on a strike. And then they look out, oh man, it's sleeting and it's cold and the weather's really cold. Do we want to be walking around out there one for all and all for one? You know, let's stop and think about this. Is there, are we being unreasonable here? <clears throat> okay, on the, and the employer, on the other hand, cannot... Uh, you know, locks, well, let's say locks out the employees and then says, wow, you know, we got that big contract at the end of the month. It's going to be a lot of profit there, but if we, um, if we have this strike and it lasts any longer, we're going to lose that contract. So there's pressures on both sides, and during that 72-hour period, um, they cannot start a lockout or a strike, um, and it gives them a, a chance for a second thought. How long can a strike last? <clears throat> well, um, there's one in England that's been going on for, I don't know, over 120 years, I think. Uh, there was a family, a very rich family, that owned a coal mine. There were uh, miners there that went on strike. The family did not did not need the mine, so they just basically closed it down. Um, and these fellows went on strike <clears throat> until they couldn't afford to do it any longer. Um, and so they would come out and on strike, on strike, and they put their signs in the ground and then they'd go to other jobs, okay? And when they passed away, okay, the family members would come out and they'd put the sign in the ground. And it was going on for, um, uh, like I said, over 100 years. Uh, and it's sort of a Guinness Book of Records now because it's all kind of uh, moot. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's say you actually do manage to get a collective agreement uh, negotiated and finally signed signed by the employer and then signed by the union for all the employees. All the employees do not get to sign. That would be a nightmare because <clears throat> even though 78% of the union employees say, yeah, it's a good agreement, there'll be some that don't like it, okay? But that's just too bad. You're a union. You go with the, with the flow. Um, so the union signs and then bingo, everybody goes back to work. What happens, though, if after this collective agreement is drafted, which is a very substantial document, um, if there's a term in there that the parties disagree on, this is a contractual dispute because you now have a contract. Um, <clears throat> okay, so you have this contractual dispute. And um, uh, an example, let's say um, the, co the collective agreement says you cannot... Um, get rid of an employee except with consultation with the union. And, and then one of the employees gets caught stealing and you fire him. And the union says, hey, you cannot do that. You didn't consult with us. And you say, well, I consult with you if I'm laying people off. But if I fire someone for stealing, I can do that without your approval. No, no, you need our approval. And suddenly there's this dispute, right? Um, and then how do you resolve that? Well, this is called a grievance, okay? That fired employee goes to the union and says, hey, they fired me, but it's wrongfully done. And then the union tries to negotiate with management, and if they can't come to an agreement, then it's referred to the Labor Relations Board. There's an arbitration, and the arbitration is by the administrative tribunal, and they make a decision one, one way or the other. Uh, two terms uh, just before we finish off. One is a wildcat strike. When does a wildcat strike occur? You're, you're bargaining, okay, to try to get a collective agreement. You are allowed to go on strike. But once you have a contract, once you have a collective agreement and it is signed and in force, then you no longer can go on a strike. And management can no longer lock you out. But um, they, they seldom, if ever, do that. 
but unions have gone on what they call wildcat strikes where they just walk off the job. Well, this is illegal. It's a breach of contract. So the employer can go to the Labor Relations Board and have the union fined, get you know damages um, paid to the business if they've suffered damages, and an injunction forcing them to go back to work. Essential services, you're hearing a lot about that in the United States right now because of COVID-19 and in Canada as well. Um, <clears throat> essential services are people like... Uh, uh, firemen, policemen, teachers, uh, nurses, um, first responders, um, and longshoremen. There, there's an odd one, eh? Longshoremen. How could they be essential services? Well, our exports by ship are so important to our economy that if the longshoremen went on strike for a short period of time, they could they could drive us into a, a recession. So they just get legislated back to work by the government. Um, nurses, yeah. Uh, why nurses and not doctors? Well, nurses are essential to keep people alive in the hospital. Doctors are, are uh, professionals, they're not unions, so they're, uh, they cannot be deemed an essential service. Um, teachers, why teachers? Well, you hear a lot about that on the news right now. Um, <clears throat> to make ends meet in, in the modern economy, um, both parents generally work, okay? Um, with both parents working, who takes care of the kids? Well, unless you have an extended family with parent, grandparents, um, then, uh, then you have to send them to daycare or you have to send them to school. So if there's no daycare, no school because of, of uh, teachers are on strike, uh, then um, the economy breaks down. One of those people have to stay home. Um, and uh, there could be a drop uh, close to 50% in pr productivity. So they made teachers an essential service. That concludes chapter four on employment law. With one exception, and that's I want to talk about the Human Rights Code again. Um, <clears throat> and um, I had a sheet of paper, and darn if I can remember where it is. So I'm going to take one quick break here, and then we'll come back. Okay, I just want to deal with the Human Rights Code a little more thoroughly than I've done in the past. Um, we have Human Rights Codes by all the provinces and the federal government to um, <clears throat> provide an avenue for addressing discrimination, even though in our Constitution Act of 1982, your rights against discrimination are supposedly protected. The difficulty with the Constitution is that if someone infringes one of my rights um, <clears throat> to be not discriminated against, my only avenue would be to commence a lawsuit in the Supreme Court of British Columbia. Um, and that can be incredibly expensive um, because a minor contractual matter generally is something like $35,000 in legal fees and up. Well, in a more complex matter like a, a discrimination case, um, the expenses can be incredibly, uh, well, much higher. Because of that, um, human rights tribunals were formed to provide people an avenue to complain against discrimination where they were not required to hire lawyers um, and did not have this uh, upfront heavy expenditure. So <clears throat> it sort of filled in a gap in our justice system. You had a legal right, but no justice because you couldn't afford it under the Constitution. Now you have a much friendlier, less costly way of going after um, someone that has discriminated against you. So it's um, an absolutely necessary statute, um, <clears throat> and it is quasi-constitutional in the sense that it, it protects um, some of our constitutional rights, but it can be uh, repealed or amended um, by the provinces. Um, you don't have to have an amending formula like you do under the Constitution. Um, under the Human Rights Code, um, either they eliminate the, the necessity of, um, uh, of intent, okay? 
if you commit a crime, you have mens rea and actus reus. You actually have to do the guilty act, but you have to have the mental intent to commit a crime. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, discrimination is not a crime um, because this is not a criminal statute, but there are penalties. Okay, so it's quasi-criminal. Um, but <clears throat> they say, okay, you, do, you can discriminate against somebody even though you did not intend to do so, which makes it... Um, a, somewhat a dangerous uh, proposition if you don't really uh, understand the law. Uh, <clears throat> it prevents discrimination, but only for those matters outlined in the code. Um, so they, the statute does not try to tell me in my mind that I cannot discriminate, okay, or I cannot think less of a uh, uh, someone with a different sexual pr uh, preference or someone from a, a different culture. Um, you have freedom of thought. Okay. But there are certain activities where our government has said, okay, no, no, no. In these activities, you cannot discriminate. <clears throat> you cannot uh, discriminate um, in a publication. Uh, <clears throat> and, and then you cannot uh, discriminate in accommodation, service, or facilities customarily provided to the public. What's this? Well, hotels, restaurants, um, and, uh, and uh, store owners, okay? And um, you cannot discriminate against the purchase of a property. Um, that happened with um, my wife and I. Um, we uh, wanted to buy a lot and... Um, <clears throat> we talked to the developer, and he seemed to be really on side, and um, we uh, met with him, and uh, he took exception to um, uh, our children who are uh, adopted and, uh, from Vietnam, and it was obvious that he did not like that. Uh, but instead of saying, hey, I'm not selling to you because... Uh, uh, you know, I don't like the fact that you've adopted kids from another country. What he did was he said, okay, yes, you can build a house, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dictate exactly what kind of house you're building. We wanted a two-floor um, house with a, uh, you know, an attached garage. And he said, no, no, you can only build a Japanese-style house, one floor. Um, we didn't pursue it because this wasn't the lot that we wanted to buy that would be the be-all and end-all. Okay. So we just said, uh, we don't need that. We didn't bother taking action against this person. But we were discriminated against um, <clears throat> in the purchase of property. A tenancy, um, a, a landlord cannot discriminate, okay? And in employment ads and employment generally, there cannot be no, any discrimination. There cannot be a discrimination in wages. There should be pay equity. And unions and associations cannot discriminate. Okay, a union... We talked about this. What's an association? Well, it would be a cooperative, like the um, uh, the grain growers um, uh, cooperative or, or a, a society. Um, you know, the um, uh, Board of Trade is a society. Well, they could not discriminate or should not discriminate. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> that's how the statute works. Um, we talked about the dangers of it. Uh, we talked about the uh, university instructor who um, had a complaint that was bogus and a uh, report goes into his file. Even though it's bogus, because there's been a report, it's in the file, that seems unfair. Um, and then we also talked about how uh, uh, Doug Collins, the um, uh, editorial um, uh, author for the North uh, Shore newspaper, um, had to pay $25,000 of his own money to get a complaint dismissed against him, even though the complainant didn't have to pay a dime. Okay, and then the third one is how the Human Rights Code could be used to um, inappropriate, well, unethically maybe, but legally to um, attack another business. Uh, that was the um, Hans, uh, uh, you are a Jew, uh, scenario that's uh, talked about in the textbook. Okay, so <clears throat> it's necessary, but there's dangers, um, and it's fraught with frailties because we're humans, but we do our best because we need it, um, because uh, there has been discrimination in the past, which is totally inappropriate. 
All right, that's, uh, that concludes uh, chapter four. The next chapter we'll be looking at is chapter seven. So we do not take chapters five and six. They're designed for the uh, tourism faculty. Um, so we go to chapter seven, which is sole proprietorships and partnerships. Thank you very much.